Good day to you all. Welcome to our webinar. This is already our fourth webinar. The other three webinars were concerning the port environment. We went to the, into the port management and the port operational side of the port. This webinar is fully concentrating on the maritime shipping industry. The topic this time is the introduction to the maritime resource management. It will be presented by Patrick Welch. The other unique thing of this webinar is it's over more than one continent. So it's being recorded in South Africa with the help of Kazakhstan in Asia and then the recording broadcasted from here from Europe, Netherlands, Rotterdam. Because of the different locations and time zones, the presentation is pre-recorded. The Q&A session will be live. As before, please use the Q&A section of this live event to ask your questions. You can post your questions during the presentation. Patrick will try to answer them live and at the end. Please enjoy and see you next time. Dear colleagues, good day. My name is Patrick Wells and STC International extends a warm welcome and thanks all of you for taking the time to join our webinar on an introduction to maritime resource management. This webinar is aimed at highlighting the importance of the need for maritime organizations to embrace and adopt the principles of maritime resource management throughout all levels within maritime organizations, irrespective of whether on board ships or ashore. Over the next few minutes, we will look at a couple of famous examples of shipping and aircraft incidents, all of which could have been avoided if the principles of resource management had been applied. Although they represent the tiniest fraction of all marine incidents, they all have common elements resulting in their disasters. Human error. We will gain an appreciation of the trends with respect to shipping losses over the past two decades and look at the factors that may have contributed to these disasters as well as how Maritime Resource Management Program is able to provide the knowledge, the skills and most importantly the attitude to your organization to minimize these risks. Finally, we will unpack the structure and method of delivery of the STC International Maritime Resource Management Program as well as the expectations and deliverables of incumbents that would need to be met in order to successfully meet the requirements of the program. Please ensure that you use the messaging tool to pose your questions which will be addressed at the end of the webinar. If you require specific information, please ensure to include your name, your email address so that we are able to provide appropriate feedback as soon as possible. We start our journey in the North Atlantic Ocean in the early morning hours of the 15th of April 1912 when the RMS Titanic sank after striking an iceberg during her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City. Of the estimated 2,224 passengers and crew on board, more than 1,500 died, making the sinking one of modern history's deadliest peacetime maritime disasters. Despite having received a series of warnings from other ships of drifting ice in the area, Captain Edward Smith ordered the ship to continue at full steam ahead and reliance was placed on the watch on the bridge for safety. It was generally believed at that time that ice posed very little danger to the larger vessels. The Tory Canyon left Kuwait with a full cargo of crude oil bound for Milford Haven in Wales. The tanker did not have a scheduled route and therefore lacked a complement of full-scale charts for her area of operations. This resulted in confusion between the master and the officer of the watch about the vessel's exact position when approaching the Isles of Scilly. Further random course alterations to avoid a fishing fleet further impacted accurate monitoring of the vessel's track. Delays in course corrections were also experienced due to the uncertainty as to whether the vessel was in manual or automatic steering mode and the Tory Canyon eventually struck Pollard's Rock on Seven Stones Reef on the 18th of March 1967. About 50 miles of French and 120 miles of Cornish coast were contaminated 
and approximately 15,000 seabirds were killed along with huge numbers of marine organisms before the 270 square miles of slick was eventually dispersed. On the 27th of March 1977, a KLM and a Pan Am Boeing 747 passenger jets collided on the runway at Los Rodeos Airport on the island of Tenerife, resulting in 583 fatalities. Everyone on board the Boeing KLM were killed, while there were only 61 survivors on board the Pan Am Boeing, all of whom were located in the front section of the aircraft. This accident, which remains to this day as the deadliest accident in aviation history, had a long-lasting influence on the industry, highlighting the vital importance of using standardized phraseology in radio communications, situational awareness, and closed-loop communications as just some examples of the findings. It resulted in the establishment of crew resource management as a fundamental part of airline pilots training. This training proved to be so successful that it was quickly adapted into the maritime environment as bridge resource management and is now known as maritime resource management. The Herald of Free Enterprise was working the route between Dover and the Belgian port of Zeebrugge, which was not her normal area of operations. She had adopted a ballasting procedure to ensure that her loading ramp was able to meet the key. She was also understaffed and under extreme pressure from Townsend Thorison management to maintain an unrealistic sailing schedule. On the night of the 6th of March, 1987, the ship left harbour with her bow doors open and with the sea immediately flooding her lower car decks, within minutes she was lying on her side in shallow water. The immediate cause of the sinking was found to be negligence on behalf of the assistant bosun, who was asleep in his cabin when he was responsible for closing the bow doors. However, the official inquiry placed more blame on his supervisors as well as the general culture of poor communications within the Thoris and Townsend organization. Of the crew of 80 and 459 passengers, this incident sadly claimed the lives of 193 persons. On the 24th of March 1989, the Exxon Valdez, bound for Long Beach, California, struck the Prince William Sound's Bly Reef, spilling 10.8 million gallons of crude oil. It is considered the worst oil spill worldwide in terms of damage to the environment. Many human factors contributed to this disaster, such as improper con, ineffective use of available navigation equipment, the master allegedly being under the influence of alcohol, as well as the vessel departing from her planned track to avoid icebergs. It was also found that the crew fatigue played an important role in this disaster, as the Exxon Shipping Company failed to supervise the master and provide a rested and sufficient crew for the Exxon Valdez. The disaster did however result in the International Maritime Organization introducing a comprehensive maritime pollution prevention rule, which we know as MARPOL, through various conventions. Possibly one of the most well-known incidents in recent maritime history is that of the Costa Concordia. Under the command of Captain Francesco Chettino, departed the port on the evening of the 13th of January 2012 on a seven-night cruise. At 21.45 local time, in very calm seas, she collided with a rock on the western coast of Italy. A 53 meter long gash was made in the port side of the hull along three compartments of the engine room, which resulted in power losses leading to a total loss of propulsion and electrical systems, which crippled the ship. Taking on water, the vessel listed to port and within 24 minutes, strong winds had pushed the vessel back onto the Giglio Island, where she grounded, resting on her starboard side in shallow waters, with most of her starboard side underwater. 
The evacuation of the Costa Concordia took over six hours and of the 3,229 passengers and 1,023 crew known to have been on board, 32 sadly died. Francesco Cettino, the ship's captain at that time, was subsequently found guilty of manslaughter, causing a mar maritime accident and of abandoning his ship. On the 8th of November 2018, while returning from naval exercises, the Norwegian frigate Helge Instat was navigating in inshore waters at speeds of 17.4 knots. She identified three oncoming vessels and established radio communications. However, miscommunications, a lack of proper lookout and assumptions created confusion on board the bridge and by the time they realized their error, they were within 400 meters of the tanker solo and it was way too late to avoid a collision. The ship's commanding officer stated he was asleep in his cabin when the collision happened and he was only awoken by the collision itself. The collision caused severe damage to the Helga Instat, which lost control of engine and steering. And despite all damage control efforts, the flood of water continued, resulting in the vessel sinking with only small sections of the superstructure remaining above the water. Seven sailors were injured. And this example serves to demonstrate that absolutely no sector of that maritime industry is exempt from human error and accidents. Our last and most recent example takes a look at the 13,900 TU, 366 meter contained ship, the Milano Bridge, which according to reports collided at high speed into a ship to shore crane during birthing operations at the port of Busan, South Korea on the 6th of April 2020. The crane collapsed onto the ship and then brought down a further two others. The vessel continued and collided with a 10,000 TEU C-SPAN Ganges, which was berthed alongside at the time just ahead. No injuries were reported and there was no clear indication as of yet as to the cause of the accident. Although investigations are ongoing, questions surrounding the bridge teamwork, communications and briefing, shared mental model between the master and the pilot, safe speed and contingency planning are just a few that would definitely need to be asked. It may easily be seen from the statistics displayed that there's been a dramatic reduction in losses year-on-year year between 2009 and 2018. Of significance is the extremely high number of losses reported in 2000, which stood at 207. This does mean that the maritime industry is clearly moving in the right direction regarding the improvement of safety at sea, but clearly still not enough has been done. Of course, every ship owner, operator, and PNI Club would like to see these figures reach zero and remain there. Taking a snapshot over the last nearly two decades, the contributing causes of shipping loss, as well as statistics relating to the type of vessels lost, it may immediately be seen that dramatic reductions in losses due to foundering have been experienced, but collisions have not reduced proportionally. A similar comparison may be made between general cargo vessels and passenger liners, which very alarmingly seem to have a slight increase in losses in the recent years. Of equal concern is the rise in the loss of fishery vessels in recent times. If we were to look at the two causes of loss, which could be argued that they relate to equipment failure or causes other than human error, unfortunately, these causes still attribute to a small percentage of the cause of shipping losses. It is therefore safe for us to conclude that most shipping losses are still very much a result of human error. So what exactly is human error? 
Although human error forms its own extremely complicated study, we will use the example of Gulilamos and Tsinatos, 1997, who describes human error in the maritime environment as errors stemming from either a knowledge base, where the lack of knowledge would result in an error, or rule-based, where an incorrect application of a good rule, the application of a bad rule, or the failure to apply a good rule would be a contributing factor to human error. However, it is not as simple as it seems. There is often a misperception that error took place just before an accident or an incident, and this was the main contributing cause. Even more alarming is that it has been found that during some accident investigations, the investigation stops as soon as a single contributing factor is found, and this is reported as the critical cause of the occurrence. This is a fatal assumption, as very often, clues or things going wrong often present themselves days, weeks, or even months prior to an accident. In order for an incident to actually occur, there will be a number of events or clues that present themselves prior to the actual incident taking place. These individual clues or events forge what we call a link as they occur. And as at each event takes place or clue presents itself, an additional link is forged which ultimately results in the creation of what we know as the error chain. Analysis has shown that all incidents have a minimum of at least four links within an error chain, but the average has at least seven links, and some error chains even having in excess of 20 links. The objective of maritime resource management training is to be able to recognize the clues as they present themselves and be equipped with the necessary knowledge, skills and appropriate attitude to be able to break the links in the error chain, thereby averting an incident or accident. The combination of errors leading to an incident or accident are countless. Although during the Maritime Resource Management Program, we will study contributing factors as well as mitigating measures in depth. Analysis has shown some of the more common examples of errors contributing to an accident would include, but certainly not be limited to, distraction, which may arise from many forms, such as radio communications, internal telephone call, background noise, or even something as simple as a light being switched on during hours of darkness. Often we do not even realize that we are being distracted and our attention has been diverted until it is way too late. Confusion may be caused by many things ranging from an automation failure on an ectus or a radar as an example, or from a misunderstanding of a verbal or a written order. As we witnessed in the Tory Canyon accident, neither the master or officer of the watch were confident of the ship's actual position, as well as not realizing that the vessel was on automatic steering whilst trying to alter course manually. Breakdown in communications is one of the most common contributing factors leading to an accident. This was very evident in the Pan Am KLM collision in Tenerife where the pilot of the KLM Boeing believed he had been given clearance to take off whilst in fact the air traffic controller had told the pilot of the Pan Am Boeing to report when clear of the runway. The likelihood of miscommunications increases exponentially when you add language barriers as well as accents into the mix. This is why the need to fully understand and practice closed loop communications is so essential. How often do we believe that sending the lookout to go and fetch something whilst on watch 
or leaving the bridge unattended, even for a few minutes, whilst in open ocean, will be okay. Nobody will know. In the case of the Tory Canyon, the master sent the officer of the watch off the bridge on three occasions just prior to the grounding. No wonder there was such confusion on the bridge with regard to the actual position. Any such deviation from an accepted bridge procedures we refer to as improper con, which unfortunately attributes to the cause of many maritime incidents. The Costa Concordia showed us a classic example of how a deviation from a passage plan can lead to catastrophic results. It is obviously acceptable to deviate from a passage plan if required, but this should only be done after a number of maritime resource management steps such as short-term strategy have been followed and the deviation has been proven to be safe to execute. These are all tools that will be unpacked carefully during the Maritime Resource Management course. Too often we witness vessels failing to adhere to collision regulations or not adhering to safe speed in the case of the Norwegian frigate Helge Instad. If we study accidents that occur in high density areas such as the English Channel, the Singapore Straits, just as two examples, we find that the majority of accidents were the result of masters and watch officers violating rules and procedures. The Herald of Free Enterprise provides us with a classic example of procedures that had not been followed and the vessel leaving the berth with her bow door still open, despite strict reporting procedures that should have been followed. Complacency is unfortunately an element that creeps into routine operations. As a person becomes more familiar with his or her duties and operations, and longer periods exist between anything out of the ordinary taking place, it is then human nature to begin to relax and believe that nothing will go wrong, until of course it does. Complacency is one of the most difficult contributing factors for us to manage. And this is only possible when correct attitude to safety is maintained at all times, which is one of the key outcomes of the STC International Maritime Resource Management Program. How do we know we have lost situational awareness when we do not even know what we are missing? Again, this is very easily achieved if we are distracted while performing our duties or overloaded to a point where we are only able to focus on our immediate surroundings or activity. The loss of situational awareness has a major impact on our decision-making process as unless we are able to see everything that is happening around us and take it into account, our decisions will be based on only a proportion of the available information, this cannot be effective or safe. By adopting the principles of maritime resource management, you will exit the program fostering a positive attitude towards a culture of safety. You will understand the importance of communicating in a clear and concise and unambiguous manner. Practice closed loop communications as well as be able to conduct detailed briefings and debriefings. Additionally, you will be able to recognize the importance and value of working as a team member rather than in isolation or independently and have an excellent understanding of team dynamics, especially during the stages of formations of teams. The Maritime Resource Management Program makes extensive use of case studies to identify errors, or clues as we call them, that could have contributed to the cause of an accident. As a result, you will exit the program with a good appreciation and ability to identify factors that contribute to the cause of accidents. In a similar manner, the program addresses hazardous thoughts such as accidents never happen to me, or 
I have done it a thousand times before. What could go wrong? And provide you with the tools to immediately be able to remedy these hazardous thoughts. Equally, by following this program, you will be provided with the knowledge, skills, and of course attitude to immediately identify the clues or error links and the remedial measures that need to be taken so that they do not form an additional link within the error chain. The less error links in the error chain, the less likely that an incident or accident will occur. The Maritime Resource Management Program will not result in immediate change. The program is aimed at a gradual and permanent change in attitude and behavior, which are by far the most difficult attributes to change. There are a total of 13 modules that will need to be completed in the STC International Maritime Resource Management Program. Each module will be executed using a combination of blended learning, ranging from online training programs supported by learner guides and course notes, webinars, as well as analyzing case studies and submitting written assignments. You will be required to attend online group discussions for each module where questions will be answered as well as feedback provided on your case studies. Each candidate will also be provided with a personal written feedback on each submitted assignment. Candidates may also choose to take this distant learning pro uh, program one step further and enroll on a two and a half day practical simulator component where all the elements of maritime resource management will be practiced using real life onboard scenarios in accredited simulation centers. Those of you who choose to elect to undertake the simulator components upon completion of the distant learning program will receive full STC International Maritime Resource Management course completion certificates. Those of you who follow the distance learning program and choose not to undertake the simulator components will receive an STC International Certificate of Completion for the theoretical component of the program. Once again, I would like to thank you for taking the time to join the webinar, get to understand the importance of why maritime resource management is so important to your organization, irrespective of the level of your employees. Please feel free to drop your questions onto the link. If there's anything of importance that you need to know, please send us an email. We will endeavor to get back to you as soon as possible. But for now, I will re remain right here and answer any questions that have been posed. Well, greetings again from a sunny Cape Town in South Africa. And thank you once again for joining this webinar on the introduction to maritime resource management. Some great questions have come through, so I thank you for that as well. And uh, the first one does make me smile because it's the first question that we get asked irrespective of, of where we facilitate this program um, around the globe. And uh, the question is uh, pretty much a very rigid hierarchy and rank structure exists on board ships and is often needed to maintain discipline. How does the maritime resource management course impact on this? Great question and a nice place to start. The Maritime Resource Management Program will never, ever, ever interfere or influence with a hierarchy or rank structure on, on board any ship or in any organization. There is a formal structure that obviously needs to maintain. The program gives not only those um, in uh, managerial positions, but those in the junior levels, the perfect tools to be able to work in in unison with one another. So an example, if a junior officer on board um, is struggling to accept perhaps a culture or a communication or a management style of, of a senior officer, it gives that junior the, the tools that he or she needs to be able to manage the relationship and integrate into a team 
in a, in a proper and appropriate manner. For example, if a master of a vessel doesn't want to hear any input from anybody, very authoritarian master, then it also gives a junior the necessary tools to be able to challenge in a diplomatic way, not the person themselves, but the concept, whether he or she feels that uh, an appropriate plan has been made or an action has been taken and just provide input because everybody on board a ship, irrespective of the level, has gone through a certain amount of training required by the IMO and therefore, obviously, has good input to add into any scenario or environment. So, uh, not that we're advocating that every single decision that's taken needs to be discussed at length with every person on board before a decision is making, but what the, the program does is it, it incorporates everybody on board. Everybody still has their rank, their position and their responsibility, but everybody on board is used effectively in a decision-making process or as part of a decision-making process. Ten brains is better than one brain, but certainly it doesn't interfere at all with the hierarchy. I hope that has answered your question. If not, just drop a question further down and then we'll get back to it. The next couple of questions are all fairly similar in, in context, and it talks about automation and the, and, um, the, the, the involvement or the relationship between humans and, and automation. The first one, however, that talks about autonomous sailing. Now, I'm not an expert in autonomous vessels, but the question goes, how does autonomous sailing contribute to a safer maritime environment in your opinion? Now, I'll, I'll answer this from a maritime resource perspective, not from a technical perspective. So if we have a crewed vessel, we have a bridge team, we will have a team in the engine room, et cetera. If, if there's some form of an emergency, there's going to be an emergency response team. So all of these teams need to be able to work efficiently and effectively in order to, to contribute to, to the running of the vessel or the resolution of some form of, of emergency. So whether your ship is manned or whether your ship is not manned, the principles will apply. Now, when we look at some of the questions a little bit later uh, that have come through, we will talk about the relationship between human or the interface between human and uh, the, the equipment. So you can imagine autonomous vessel may, let's just for a moment assume that there's absolutely nobody on board there still has to be a control team ashore that is monitoring every single aspect of that vessel and be able to override in the case of some form of an emergency. So you can imagine the ship being a piece of equipment and then the team ashore being another part of the team. So you will still get communication between the ship and the team ashore. If an alarm goes off on the ship, it is essentially sending a challenge to the team ashore saying, hey, watch out, something isn't going on in the in that is supposed to be going on. We need to take some form of action or please be aware that something is out of the norm. Now the team ashore can either override that, they can they can take a decision to ignore it or they can take a decision to act on it. So that would be closing that communication, how they, how they respond. So already we see some of the components of marine, uh, maritime resource management coming through quite strongly in terms of autonomous vessels. So to, to get back to the question, uh, is it a safer maritime environment? No, I don't believe it is. It's saving on human resources, but for every human that you are that you are taking off the vessel, you've got to replace that with some form of machinery, which still has to be monitored. And that goes a little bit later. One of the questions that I will share with you: it goes. In, uh, we talk about the authority and assertiveness between the machine 
and the human on board. But let's hold that one for, for a little bit later. So to answer the question, I don't believe it is exactly safer, but basically we just shift the dynamics within a team. The next question that's come through is taking, into, uh, taking the Helga Instat, that was the Norwegian vessel, a uh, naval vessel that had an accident into account, as well as the fact that naval officers undergo rigorous training. In your opinion, is maritime resource management, or if maritime resource management was so effective, why would this incident have occurred? Great question. So if any of the viewers are ex-naval officers, uh, you will recognize the fact that naval officers do undergo very rigorous training. The entire dynamics and the structure on board naval vessels differs completely to that of merchant vessels. On a, uh, in a naval vessel, you will have a command team uh, in a operations room somewhere in the depth of the vessel. You will also have a team on the bridge and you will have the master or the executive officer or some, some other officer that will always be listening in on all sorts of communications. So you have many, many, many more members of various teams contributing to the flow of information and the safety and the operation of the vessel. So if we look at the, the case of the Helga Instat, so they were coming into restricted waters. They were returning from naval exercise after a number of weeks. They were almost home. They were on that very, very, very last stretch. So automatic, automatically, everybody takes a sigh of relief. They let their guard down. Everything's gone fine or they've been safe for three or four weeks. They've got an hour to go until they get alongside and they start to relax. They start to become complacent because they're in an area with which they are familiar. So the officer of the watch communicates with three vessels that are outbound. They're on their way into the, into the port, but they are communicating with vessels other than the ones they actually thought they were. So immediately they made an assumption. So their awareness of the situation, they believe they're talking to certain vessels, but in reality, they're talking to other vessels. So they think everything's under control, but actually it's not. Then the Helga Instat was talking to the vessel traffic services in a foreign language, a language other than English. And the officers on board the solar weren't able to understand. So now on the solar, you've got a certain perception or what we call a mental model. On the Helga Instat, they've got a completely different picture and the two vessels are, may as well be worlds apart, except the reality of, of, of the fact is that they're very, very close. By the time the team on board, the Helga Instat realized what was going on, it was way, way too late and they collided with one another. So you can see the links of the error chain building up slowly. So although they've got many, many, many more people who are all contributing to the safety of that vessel, the principles of maritime resource management, closed loop communication, challenge and response, situational awareness, they were all overlooked and each one contributed to a link of the error chain. And as we said earlier, you need only four links for an accident or an incident to take place. If we had to unpack this further, we would probably pick up 15, 20 of them. So irrespective of training, if the fundamental principles and protocols are not adhered to, if anybody within that team had realized, hey guys, or team, we're not actually communicating with the right vessel, and they had challenged at that point, very, very easily that error chain could have been broken. So to cut a very long story short, basically the principles of maritime resource management weren't adhered to, and ultimately resulted in an, not the only cause, but it participated, it contributed to that accident. I hope that has answered that question. If we move on to the next one, uh, within the webinar, you state that MRM is an important for all levels, whether onboard or ashore. 
Taking into account the amount of automation being introduced on board, do you consider maritime resource management to be future-proof for seafarers? Great question. And this also can be answered in sort of combination with the very first question or the second question that we that was posed. So yes, I do believe it's it's future proof. And why do I say that? And I go back to equipment being part of the team. What we have to be very careful of here is the amount of authority that we allow a piece of equipment to, uh, to assume. So we have two types of, of, of people. We have those that 100% will rely on electronic equipment. So whatever it does, whatever it tells you, it's right. And it never is challenged by an officer of the watch or an officer of the watch of an engine room. So irrespective of, of uh, the information that's been fed out, it's accepted as true. And that's not always the case. What happens then is the equipment starts becoming more and more and more authoritative. And as the equipment gets smarter, and as it starts suggesting more and more and more to us, those members or those, those seafarers or people on board that are 100% reliant on this electronic information are blindly going to follow. That may not be the right thing to do. You get the other side of, of the coin, and it's those people who pretty much are old school and just, it has to be on the bridge, not really interested in it. I want to do things the old way. And all of a sudden, the Ectus or the ARPA provide an alarm. And what do we do? We cancel the alarm without even acknowledging what that alarm is about. Now, that alarm is challenging the officer of the watch, whether in the engine room or whether on the bridge. It's saying, hey, please take attention. Something is out of the ordinary. And again, I've said this before, either we can respond in an appropriate manner, go look what's happening, verify what that piece of equipment is telling us and make a decision based on that and move on. But if we keep canceling and we don't, we don't acknowledge as those alarms build, we're going to lose them behind a pile of, of old alarms. So we're not using that piece of equipment as part of our resources within a, a safe decision-making um, context. So we will only be able to make MRM future-proof if people accept the principle that it's not only people that form part of a team, engine room or bridge, we need to use every single solitary piece of equipment as part of our team. We need to understand that we need to communicate with this equipment, that we can the equipment can challenge us, and we can respond to it, that we have to have a balance between authority of assertiveness, make sure that we as humans will always be the ultimate decision makers and not rely 100% on the equipment then of course, MRM will be future-proof. I hope that's answered. If not, just text, uh, drop some more text and we'll, we'll see where we go. Then I, the next question, very similar in nature. Good morning. In this context, implement technology developments, minimize human error, um, can be attributed to people's lack of experience, training and skill. And then the, the question continues, can it be caused by technological complexity on, on the ships? Indeed, if I understand your questions correctly, it's very close to the previous question. Now, to go a little bit, a little bit further, um, automation really brings down the workload within the engine room and on, uh, on, on the bridge as well. Under normal circumstances, if we are appropriately trained, we understand how to use our equipment if we pre-plan. Uh, so if we use an example of an Ectus, if you plan every leg ahead just before you do it, while your ship is underway, there's gonna be a lot of workload and attention focused on planning while we go. But if your 
passage planned for the next three weeks is planned as per protocol, planned, it's inputted into the ECTUS, it's been approved, it's saved. Basically, all we have to do on board the passage, unless we deviate, is to monitor our planned track. Our workload reduces dramatically until something goes wrong. If the ECTUS malfunctions or there's something that goes on, on uh, wrong with it, and we haven't been trained appropriately to manage these errors uh, that, that take place, our workload then starts going higher and higher and higher and higher. And often it puts us under undue stress, especially if something goes wrong in an area of, of sort of a high traffic density as, as an example. And then our lack of training, our lack, our lack of experience is going to actually detriment us in our decision making. But if we're appropriately trained, if we have the experience, if you practice the what ifs during the quiet time so that when something goes wrong, you can immediately start, start correcting it, then of course it's going to support you. So nothing will ever take away training and expertise in terms of um, in, in, in terms of um, our ability to to manage a vessel or to cope with a particular uh, circumstance or uh, situation. Um, and the more technical our vessels become, the more we have to be trained to cope with that technology. Um, and it's great while it works. When it doesn't work then I think we have a little bit of a challenge. That's why it's always good to have backup number two, backup number two, uh, backup number three, sorry. And, and that's where short-term strategy, when our first, when our first uh, plan doesn't work, quickly let's change to second plan, make sure everybody within the team fully understands that we have a change in plan, execute it, off we go. I hope that's answered. I don't see any more questions coming through. Um, oh, the, one more here. Sorry, one has just arrived now. Do you believe that machines will remove or reduce the presence of human resources in a vessel in the future? If so, will this reduce casualties? This is very, very close to the, the second question or the third question that we answered in terms of autonomous vessels. Even if we take people off the ships, we will always have a team ashore overriding and monitoring. So, um, no, and this isn't really a maritime res resource management um, a question. It's, it's more in terms of autonomous vessels, but I think that that's already been answered a little earlier in the, in the program. So that's the end of the questions for now. Um, as we mentioned earlier, if there's any questions uh, further or after this webinar, please feel free to, free to drop them on an email for us. We will certainly endeavor to answer them to the best of our abilities. We do look forward to uh, registrations on the program and hopefully see you um, during, yeah, later in the, in the program. That's uh, the first of the, the venues. Thank you very much. Take care, stay safe.